no matter how smart you are, if you have made no contribution to the country and society, you cannot be called a talent. You need to find jobs that can contribute to the national development. During this uh, containment of COVID-19, a lot of past 90s are working as uh, uh, medical personnel and as well as volunteers at the front line of combating the disease, which is a great embodiment of their personal values. So we believe that the students should maintain a long-term perspective and widen your choices in job selection. One of our students in our university uh, has been a volunteer in the village area and she has been helping the villagers to sell their farm products online, which I think is a great example to, to, um, in terms of job seeking. Many of the students who have already signed their contract have chosen the job position that can really contribute to the recovery of the economy as well as development. So I want to also call out to the employers. I think uh, this is time to act uh, counterclockwise and uh, um, to release uh, this new enrollment plan to recruit the best talent, which I think will be a great solid foundation in terms of human resources for these businesses as well. Last but not least, for my students, especially in the graduate students, we will finally pull through this disease and we'll see the flowers blooming really again. In no generation of young people, are uh, my question is about Dr. Obinshan, and uh, one of the villages that is uh, on the stage, 48 households have been moving out of poverty and have been moving into the modern art modern So, where does your confidence of the quality of this innovation uh, come from? Thank you for the question. I agree with my fellow members. The uh, job seeking of the college students also calls for greater um, and longer perspective. We are at a very remote place in Liangshan, and the roads are not properly and well constructed, so it has hindered our economic and social development. Poverty aviation to um, live a well of life is our aspiration. This is the final year for this uh, poverty aviation effort that campaign and I will, I will have to say that uh, our, as partners we are working very hard, especially the party members. Uh, we have a team of uh, party members and uh, local carters who have been paying visits to all of the households. We have even have 23 carters that have sacrificed their lives during this uh, effort. And they are truly work workaholics. But uh, they are uh, they are uh, regarded as heroes in the eyes of uh, the people, and uh, some of them lost their lives at a young age, early age of uh, 36. Second, in our county, in the Putuo village of Jing County, an old man called Mahamu has a grandchild saying that uh, in the past we do not have uh, um, electricity light, but now we ha have already ha we are uh, enjoying the brightness that is brought about by light, which also brings us with hope and power to move forward. 
Three, we have now faster access to the transportation system and uh, the other facilities in the past. We are living basically in the delivery uh, system and the infrastructure, but right now we are one step closer to the well of uh, society, to the moderately well of society. This is um, because of uh, our, the hard work of our local cottage. That's why in our uh, in Liangshan, we are making and deploying the high-caliber cadres to come to the grassroots and provide services and for the people and address their problems. That's why we have to pay tribute to the SCPC as well as the Central Committee for your support of uh, the e-minority group. Wait, I also want to thank all of uh, the uh, people with uh, my local dialect. The targeted poverty alleviation is effective, and our uh, party and the government are truly our savior. That was our coverage on the Corridor interview event hosted in the Great Hall of the People, uh, the, the, the lead-up to the first plenary meeting of this year's CPPCC session. You're listening to China Radio International and Long Island, and this is a special program on the opening of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference for the year 2020, which is scheduled to kick off in just a moment at 3 p.m. Beijing time. The two sessions is an important window to look at China's policy decisions in the macroeconomic level. Chinese economy took a hit in the wake of COVID-19. In the first quarter of this year, we saw a negative growth in GDP by 6.8% year on year. The government has outlined measures to stabilize employment, the finance sector, investment, foreign trade, and the general economic prospects. We're also working on safeguarding people's basic livelihood, the health of market entities, the food and energy security, the health and industrial and supply chains, and the day-to-day -day operations of public services on the grassroots level. Each year at the gathering of the two sessions, one of the hottest topics is surrounded on the GDP growth projection in the Premier's presentation of the government work report. In recent years, as China entered a stage of economic restructuring, the government has lowered the projection of GDP growth, but instead turned to further reform and opening up to release new growth drives. This year, given the state of the economy in the aftermath of COVID-19, there is going to be more eyes on possible stimulus policies and deepening reform measures. Guo Weimin, spokesman for the 13th National Committee of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, says the country's economic and social development has been resilient against the impacts of COVID-19. In general, the fundamentals of China's social and economic development have remained stable. This fully shows that China's economy has demonstrated the overall advantages as a super large-scale economy in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic, including strong resilience, huge potential, and maneuver room. Or says China has introduced a raft of policies to mitigate the virus impact and offered practical support for small and medium-sized enterprises. Meanwhile, he says China will advance reforms and ease market access. The global industrial chain and supply chain structures formed over the years are relatively stable. The international community should work together to ensure the stability of global supply chain, preventing the world economy from falling into a recession. He also says China will improve the business environment and continue to promote international economic and trade cooperation. Speaking of new growth engines, domestic consumption is playing an increasingly bigger role in the national economy. But in order for it to fuel economic growth, we need to make sure people have both the means and the will to spend. 2020 was the year in which China had aimed to eradicate absolute poverty across the country. Since 2015, China has lifted more than 93 million people out of extreme poverty thanks to the coordinated efforts from the central government through the grassroots level. But we're still in the final sprint. 52 counties, more than 2,700 villages, and more than 5.5 million people still need help to make the leap above the poverty line according to local standards. And nearly 5 million people are on the verge of sliding back to poverty. 
In the final year of the poverty alleviation campaign, we are facing the biggest challenges, both from the marginal benefit of the effective policy tools and from the complications caused by the COVID-19. So it is worth watching as to what measures will be deployed to crack the toughest nuts. Uh, meanwhile, uh, experts are also looking forward to measure measures aimed at promoting businesses and preventing backslides, which can make the poverty alleviation program sustainable in the long term. Compared to the densely populated region in southeast China, the vast territory of West China is yet to achieve the same level of prosperity. And as part of the initiative to tackle poverty and unleash new growth drives, China is doubling down on efforts to promote development in the country's western areas. Our reporter Su Yi has more on this. The 12 western provincial level regions are home to about 25% of China's population, and they cover more than 70% of its total area. But the local per capita GDP only accounts for two-thirds of the country's average, and less than half of the eastern regions. The new guideline comes 20 years after China launched its Go West strategy. It puts a prominent emphasis on the balanced development of the country's eastern and western parts. Wang Wen with Chongyang Institute for Financial Studies at Renmin University says coordinated development is imperative. It pushes for the development of the western regions in the new era was the vision of coordinated development of economy, people's livelihoods and ecological environments aiming to help the regions to catch up with the development pace of the eastern areas and ensure the two parts complete the building of a moderately prosperous society in all respects at the same time. According to the guideline, the Western regions as a whole will basically realize socialist modernization by 2035, with its public service level, infrastructure connectivity, and people's living standard on par with the eastern regions. It also stresses the importance of the regions in the Belt and Road Initiative. Specifically, it says a multi-billion dollar cooperation project between China and Singapore. We soon see more progress in Chongqing Municipality, a major thoroughfare and transportation hub in the region. Wang Wen says the regions are expected to play a big role in international trade and cooperation. The trade is designed based on a global vision. The move will help foster various cooperation among members of the Belt and Road Initiative. The inland transportation hubs will play a more important role in international trade. The guideline also calls for new tech companies to be set up in the region and tourism promoted. For the goals to be achieved, it promised strong policy support and organizational guarantees for the Western development. That was Xu Yi reporting on China's new Go West initiative. Coincidentally, the year 2020 also happens to be the year where China concludes its 13th five-year plan and reached the goal of building a moderately prosperous society. More specifically, a moderately, moderately prosperous society entails progress in preventing and diffusing major risks, which in most cases addresses the financial industry in poverty alleviation, which we've already talked about early on, and in preventing and containing environmental pollution. And in terms of environmental pol protection, we've seen noticeable progress in recent years. Smoggy days are getting fewer in the capital city of Beijing. Following the city of Shanghai, many cities, including Beijing, have started practicing garbage sorting. A fishing ban was introduced to cover the Yangtze River to repair the ecological damage or, or overfishing and pollution and the surface water quality nationwide has seen improvement year on year. So we will be naive to assume that we've done everything there is to fix the environment. So environmental protection policies is something worth looking out for at this year's session. Meanwhile, a moderately prosperous society is not as simple as getting rid of extreme poverty. Housing, elderly care, education and health care, as well as cultural development, they're all issues that Chinese people care so much about. And in recent years, a lot of the attention is directed on a fair and balanced distribution of resources and public services. All of this requires the government to continue challenging itself in improving its governance. As we begin talking about a 14-5-year plan, these will be the issues that people care about. And the two sessions is just the occasion for government to communicate to the top legislature, the top advisory body, and ultimately to the people. 
This year, the draft civil code is submitted to China's top legislature for final deliberation, containing 1,260 articles. The draft is the most extensive legislation in China, as well as the only legislation with the officially called a code. So、um, we can expect this to be on the agenda of this year's two session as well. So these are the issues that will be covered in the comprehensive legal document of China's civil code, and soon to be under the final deliberation at the upcoming two sessions. You're listening to China Radio International and our special program on the opening meeting of the CPPCC session for the year 2020. The meeting is being held in downtown Beijing at the Great Hall of the People. Let's now turn to the main venue of the event.、Um, so the last mile could be even more difficult. What do you think are the biggest challenges when it comes to picking the re-、uh, helping the rest of the people out of poverty?、Uh, I think the key is still、uh, capacity building because uh, the, uh, that can take place on both sides. One is the, the governance level, so uh, the uh, local uh, orders or local government officials. Need to be、uh, elevated in terms of their management capacity, and the other is、uh, to support the、uh, employment. And so,、uh, only uh, able uh, by time they they are able to master、uh, more professional expertise,、uh, foreign businesses or、uh, coastal businesses will be able to relocate over there. Uh, with the right type of、uh, investment environment, with the right type of human capital, and、uh, the other is、uh, technology. So the right now、uh, infrastructure development is already、uh, much is done. So、uh, right now, how the soft、uh, part、uh, can be developed in terms of a technology intent? For example, I visited the a mountainous area in Shanxi Province where. Uh, how they can really、uh, pitch it back on the e-commerce platform.、Uh, how they can、uh, build up their own storage、uh, refrigeration、uh, system, yeah, and、uh, how they can re- really arrange the business. We'll be to, hearing live feed. You are watching this live signal, the opening of China's top advisory body, the CPPCC. Earlier on in the program, we watched CPPCC members taking questions from the media at the members corridor, and that was first、uh, that was debuted back in 2018. And we'll be listening to the work report by the chairman of the national committee. Dear members, friends, members, 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 members,
the standing committee of the NPC and the state council. And its agencies also have their representatives here with us. We also have the overseas Chinese welcome you all. Now I declare the third annual session of the 13th National Committee of Chinese People's Political Conservative Conference is officially kicked off. Now please all rise up. And sing the national anthem. Dear members, ever since the outbreak of the novel coronavirus, under the leadership of CPC Central Committee with General Secretary Xi Jinping at its core, we have made steadfast efforts and the battle in Wuhan and Hubei has been won and the prevention and control of the epidemic nationwide has also made big headways. We have made coordination in controlling and preventing the coronavirus, and our economic and social development has gone somewhere. In front of this severe epidemic, a group of medics, cadres, employees, community workers have sacrificed and also some of those infected people have died from this disease. So to the martyrs and the deceased, we want to pay our tribute. Now please observe a moment of silence. In the great hall of the people, we need to remember and honor the heroes who fell in the fight against COVID-19. At the very beginning of the coronavirus epidemic in the city of Wuhan, the was overwhelmed by patients, local health care resources were stretched, thing and people could not get tested in critical time. In light of this situation, countless medical professionals from the rest of the country rushed to the city of Wuhan to lend a helping hand. And it wasn't just the medical professionals, but also civil servants, social workers and volunteers during the fight. Some of them succumbed to the illness. And so today, we are here to remember those people who submit the ultimate sacrifice to help out when the nation is in the end of the observation. Please take your seat. The opening ceremony has three items on the agenda. Now let's begin the first item. The CPCC 13th National Committee agenda. Now, member, please read the draft. The first session of the 13th National Committee of CPCC has the following agenda. According to the draft, firstly, we will listen to and deliberate the National Committee Standing Committee report. Second, we will listen to and deliberate the Standing Committee and National Committee draft on the work report ever since the second annual session of the Standing National Committee of the CPCC. Third, attend to search plenary session of the NPC and listen to the government work report and the other reports and also discuss the civil law draft. Fourth, deliberate and approve the political 
decision of the third annual session of the 13th National Committee of CPPCC deliberate and approve the Standing Committee's work report of the third annual session of the 13th National Committee of CPPCC deliberate and discuss and approve the proposal committee's review decision of this third annual session. Seven, prepare and select the uh, secretary of this third annual session. Dear members, do you have any objection to this agenda? If no, please approve and approve this agenda. Now let's begin the second item on this agenda. I invite Chairman Wang Yang on behalf of the CPPCC and the Standing Committee of the 13th CPPCC to deliver the work report.